nice to see so many well-known faces in the room. Hello, um, and welcome everyone uh, on our panel on privacy engineering for transparency and accountability. My name is Frank Pallas. I'm a senior researcher at TU Berlin, and I'm kind of coordinating all the privacy engineering activities at our department. And I have the honor of um, yeah, guiding you through this panel. And with this panel, we want to illuminate and discuss how conscious and legally well-defined technical um, engineering can actually contribute to um, privacy rate, transparency, and accountability in a, well, in a constructive manner. And basically, we all know that transparency and accountability are core privacy principles codified in the GDPR and many other legislations. And what well, basically all of us engage in transparency and accountability on a daily basis, right? I mean, um, who of you is kind of involved in formulating privacy policies? Just give me a hand. Who is actually developing systems that need to be reflected in privacy policies? All right, so um, the latter group or both groups, um, yeah, you will be kind of updating privacy policies on a daily or weekly basis in order to have them reflect detailed and, um, well, actually accurate information about what you're doing with personal data in your systems and so on. And all those that are not involved in these processes will probably on a daily basis take a 45 minute break for consciously reading the privacy policy of a service you want to use and, well, making a well-informed and conscious decision about whether to use a certain service, whether to give away your data and so forth. Um, no, basically not. Um, and this basically not is basically a sign for a dysfunctionality in the current mode of operation, how we are actually implementing transparency and accountability in the real world. Um, everybody knows that it's not the secret or so that well, privacy policies are not read. Um, they do not actually fulfill their intended functionality and so forth. And well, that is what we want to speak about in this panel. And um, we, we are quite conscious that we can do better and that we can do better with technology, that we can come up with new technologies that actually fulfill the goals of transparency better, make people better informed and allow them to make more informed decisions and so forth. And for doing so, we put together an awesome panel for today. Um, we start with Katarina Körner. Katarina is um, working for the International Association of Privacy Professionals, located in the Valley, and established and coordinated all those activities there on privacy engineering over the past two years or so. And she's doing so with great success globally, I think. Um, most of you will have met her before. Otherwise, you will see her today for the first time. And it will definitely not be the last time. Um, she'll provide a brief introduction to the legal dimension of transparency and accountability. And she will illuminate particularly the industry positions in this regard. Following up, we have Elias Grunewald. Um, he is a doctoral researcher at TU Berlin in our group. Uh, particularly focusing on privacy engineering for transparency, especially in modern DevOps-driven systems uh, and environments. And uh, by the way, who, who knows the term DevOps? All right, that's a good sign. So CPDP is becoming more technical over the years. That's great. Um, let's do more of that. <laughs> um, and here provide an academic perspective on transparency-focused privacy engineering, especially in DevOps-focused systems. Then we have Zuhakra Sharma, um, who is unfortunately only available remotely because of some visa issues or so. Um, he is a chief scientist at Privado, a company that provides privacy and especially transparency-focused solutions um, to their customers. He has sketched the industry landscape of transparency technologies as we see them today. And then finally, we have Isabel Wagner. She is an associate professor of cybersecurity at the University of Basel. Um, among tons of different privacy-related research uh, subjects, she is particularly interested in, well, measurement methods to create transparency for corporate surveillance systems, and she will provide us a brief insight um, to her respective research on what she calls adversarial transparency, and that's quite a, quite a good term, and we'll discuss a lot about that. 
um, and thereby she will broaden the scope for our subsequent discussions. Um, before we start, just a, uh, some very brief notes on the procedure. Um, every panelist will come up here to the stage and give a brief maximum seven minutes, uh, well, flashlight talk on their subject. Um, each of these flashlight talks will then be followed by a very brief opportunity to, give, uh, to, to raise one or two, um, well, questions of urgent uh, understanding. So please, please avoid doing a content discussion or content related, um, well, yeah, discussion questions in, in this very brief slot. So just for the case that it, well, kind of a central term wasn't clear to you. So you have the opportunity to raise one or two very brief questions then. Um, then the next speaker will come up and then we'll proceed. After the fourth speaker, we will proceed with a um, with the question and discussion round. First among the panelists, and then you will also have the opportunity to raise your own questions. So that's it for me. Um, now let me, well, introduce Kat to the stage. Thank you, Frank for this kind introduction and a warm welcome to the audience. I'm very happy to be here. It's an honor to be invited by the Technical University of Berlin to be part of this panel. And I will kick off our session with an introduction to the topic, first with a very short, oops, back, short but obligatory reference uh, to the legal requirements for transparency and accountability which we can find in Article 5, stating that all personal data shall be processed in a transparent manner, and the controller must be able to demonstrate compliance with this requirement. We have further references to the transparency requirement in other articles and recitals of the GDPR. I picked recital 78 to show that the GDPR is very clear about that the measures to comply with it need to align with data protection by design and by default and include measures for transparency regarding the processing of personal data to enable data subjects to monitor the processing and to enable the controller to improve security features. Further references to transparent, uh, transparent processing we find in the data subject rights in articles 12 and following, as well as article 30, and I'm not gonna go there. You can find that um, easily. So, in a very recent uh, report by the Future of Privacy Forum, maybe you have attended the session before lunch where the report was discussed, analyzing case law around Article 25, which is about data protection by design and by default. It also became evident that not providing data subjects with transparent information may constitute a violation of the data protection by design and by default principle. I'm a very big fan of Article 25. I just think there's so much in there. You can find it here. And I want to emphasize, emphasize that it clearly states that when processing personal data, the state of the art of data protection needs to be our guiding light. So what does that mean, state of the art? So for me, a classic example is always when browsing the internet a few years ago, we were all used to doing this with a HTTP connection only. Whereas nowadays, if we do not see this little lock next to the URL that shows us that our connection is uh, using uh, encryption when our information is being sent to the server, we do not really trust that web website very much. So we expect an, an encrypted HTTPS connection. So in this case, the state of the art has clearly evolved. <clears throat> so in fact, there's not a lot of guidance out there that explains in more detail what state of the art means, but a couple of years ago, and actually updated this month, there's a guideline of the German Teletrust IT Security Association, uh, which in cooperation with ENISA, the European Agency for Cybersecurity, uh, published uh, uh, yeah, this guideline on the subject. And according to this guideline, state of the art can be described described as procedures, equipment, or operating methods that achieve a legal protection objective in the most effective manner. Or in other words, is the IT security measure with the best performance, where scientific knowledge and research has reached market majority or has been launched on the market. I find that quite helpful. 
And when we look into another ENISA report, a very recent one from last year, January last year, on data protection engineering, we can also see that the lack of control and transparency is clearly pointed out by ENISA as an evolving privacy challenge. Such a challenge that it cannot be solved, as Sinisa states here, in a traditional intuitive way, but addressing this challenge uh, needs rethinking and redesigning of processing operations with a prominent role for technology as an element of guarantee. And luckily enough, there is really no lack of privacy tech. So privacy technology is clearly on the rise there is not only a huge, huge research com community working on various privacy engineering topics, but the vendor scene uh, shows that this research has already reached market majority and there are plenty of privacy tech vendors, open source resources and successful real world use cases and implementations of privacy engineering tools and approaches. So the IPP, um, where I'm working, has an annual privacy tech vendor report. And this vendor report shows very clearly that the privacy tech industry has grown tremendously over the past few years. Actually, we see a rise of 620% between our first report in 2017 and the last one from 2022, which already lists uh, 300, almost 370 privacy tech vendors ready to help you with your privacy compliance and beyond. I'm in touch with many of those vendors and I th just think that the work is amazing. I, I'm a big fan. And one of those technologies we can in fact call transparency enhancing technologies or TETs. So TETs, that's not a new concept. We have fundamental literature from 2008 and many papers in those years already defining TETs or transparency enhancing technologies um, as for example, tools that provide clear visibility to data subjects about the data controllers' data handling and which can help the data subjects to exercise their rights by technological means. So sure, it is true that so far um, privacy has mostly been managed paper-based and especially with transparency, uh, we are used to think of privacy policies, um, that's primarily it. Uh, which, uh, as we all probably know from our own experience, we do not read anyways. So uh, TETs uh, can now help with exactly that. It's a, a huge uh, term that covers various approaches from privacy as code to privacy dashboards to using APIs for communicating privacy policies to now this automated comparisons of infrastructure and data handling. We'll hear so much more about this in the session. Um, and so it's huge, it's coming, it's already here. And as you could see, it's not only a legal requirement to have data protection by default and by design supporting data subject rights, but privacy technologies to also offer many benefits that go beyond this uh, compliance only. And what are some of those benefits? Well, um, efficiency and accuracy. So automation reduces manual effort and human error. That's um, pretty obvious, I think. We can uh, save time and costs. If you have automated privacy compliance processes, you of course save time and uh, save costs associated with manual reviews. You have improved regulatory compliance. It's easier to demonstrate this compliance during audits or investigations. You can do proactive risk mitigation, so you can identify and address privacy risks at an early stage with a proactive approach uh, to reduce the likelihood of data breaches or uh, consequential reputational damage. We have this big asset or advantage of scalability and adaptability, allowing to handle large data vol volumes and to adapt to evolving privacy regulations more efficiently. We have um, consistency throughout the organization, leading to coherent and reliable user experience. We have TETs that provide developers with resources and guidelines to implement re uh, privacy requirements and simplifies privacy compliance in the long run if you set it up right. Then we empower data subjects to, or individuals to exercise their privacy rights more efficiently. So we have this user-centric approach to privacy that um, TETs or privacy tech in general can help with. And um, yeah, we have the competitive advantage, so privacy is a business enabler. I think with Apple as example, it's always um, is also very true with privacy tech. 
And finally, I think that's the most important point, we can enhance user trust. And as I think this is the most important aspect, I would like to conclude um, with uh, this. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not <laughs> uh, I will conclude with this by pointing out uh, our brand new IPP uh, consumer trust survey that shows that not even 30% of consumers say they can easily understand how our organization actually protects their data, while they're also stating that clear information about that would enhance their trust. So as I think uh, Ron Rosenthal from the Dutch government already said yesterday, and I strongly agree, to earn trust, you need to be transparent. Thank you very much. Awesome, Katerina. Join us on the sofa. <laughs> um, are there any urgent questions that need to be raised bef before you see the whole picture? That's not the case? There we go. Yeah, thank you so much, Katerina, for um, giving this, this great introduction, because now I don't have to explain to you again the legal foundations. Um, what we now do is a little deep dive into the technical details of transparency enhancing technologies. Um, and for that, I also prepared some slides, which are here. And you see this little bird, why it is there, you will see in a minute. Um, what I coin or try to coin is a new term, which is called cloud native, um, uh, cloud native privacy engineering, where several terms are in. And privacy, of course, is a term that you all have an opinion on, and probably we all discuss uh, from a daily, uh, on a daily business. But for for the following um, minutes, we want to stick to the GDPR definition. But of course, all of which we are doing are uh, is also applicable to other privacy laws. Privacy engineering is a discipline that you probably also know. So these guys that want to merge the, the two worlds from the legal domain and the technical stuff. And what is new now is this cloud native prefix, which basically addresses the new application infrastructures and system designs that we see out there and that are um, not discussed um, in many panels and, and other discussions, which is a pity, I think, because we have to deal with actual system designs and not only speak about cookie banners, which are just the surface of, of large-scale systems. So this is how actual system architectures look like, and this is even uh, only a picture from 10 years ago. So this is when Twitter or Netflix um, published some details on their application infrastructure, which means that there are individual services, more than 500 um, of them, that are communicating with each other, that are storing personal data, that are transferring them in within an organization, but also to the outside. And we cannot do as we did over the, the last 20 years with manual processes to, to cover such a complex infrastructure. But what we do in practice and what we see um, right now as a transparency measure is basically this, this like kilometers of privacy policies and maybe um, a variety of different cookie banners and we can discuss in the details on the color of, of the reject button, but what we actually have to deal about is how to deal with the, with the complexity of these actual systems that we have. Um, what the DPAs provide us with are Excel sheets. This is an actual example of the CNEO, how to do accountability, and I don't think that it's possible to, to cover an application architecture like this one with such an Excel sheet, and that's why we have to do better. For that, um, we identify, of course, some academic uh, pro problems when we deal with these microservice architectures, and we, of course, want to stick to the law, and that's why we have to develop some new technologies that actually implement the, the regulatory um, demands into transparency enhancing technologies. And that's why we built um, new tools for developers that controllers can use that are for well-intentioned actors and not adversaries. Um, so what we can do is we consider the system as a black box and we can describe what is going on there, what are the purpose limitations, the storage uh, limitation, and so on. And we provide some, some technical measures for that well. But if we go, go into more details, we have to look at actual databases. And if we are in, in systems like the Netflix architectures, there are probably more than 500 of them. So we have to also look at the little details, where is uh, personal data stored at rest, or where is it in motion or in transit. And if we have these application infrastructures that are so big that you cannot do that manually by just emailing your colleagues about what, where do you store the data and, and, and ask them in a manual or a telephone process, 
we have to we have to do better. For the first perspective, the black box approach, we developed a machine readable transparency information standard. It's not yet an official standard, but all the people are talking about we need a structured format for it and transparency information. Here is one. It's called tilt and it has all the um, all the fields necessary to express the transparency information elements that are required by law and can be expressed in a machine readable format, um, heavily facilitating the, um, the process. And now, if we have such a format, we want to integrate it into state-of-the-art developer tools because developers are the ones that have to implement these measures. For that, we can do stuff like data loss prevention systems. We have an approach here. You can also do API documentation where you use the, um, the standards that developers already use and plug in these, this transparency language because then you actually marry legal and the tech domain and we have to do stuff like infrastructure monitoring for transparency to actually uh, capture the traffic between these services. And we have to do that to actually um, get a complete picture of such a system. Um, lastly, I want to emphasize that we have different responsibilities and different roles in this, in this whole process. So if we distinguish between the data controller on one hand and the data, data subject, um, both of these parties have different needs and both of them have um, have different stages in which stuff could happen. So the first one, the first stage which I, which I already talked about is this complex infrastructure um, stage where you have, have actually to employ some of these technologies, for example, to collect the transparency information within an infrastructure, doing some smart annotation mechanism by observing traffic, by documenting it using our uh, machine readable format. It's a hard process, as we will also see in the industry perspective, but if you do that, you have to store it in some format. We propose one, there are others uh, as well, but I think this one is um, quite a good starting point. And if we have that information at hand, we have to structure it and we have to provide it in different forms for different needs. So of course, we have different interfaces um, that, that could appear depending on the context. So we can, if we have the information at hand, at hand, we can generate a textual privacy policy if that is needed and desired. Yes, we can do that. But we have other contexts where systems exist that don't have a little display where you can read a privacy policy, but you need other interfaces. And these can be chatbots, these can be privacy dashboards, these can be browser extensions, and this can even be cross-provider analysis of this transparency information. Because if you have it once in, in such a structured format, you can do analysis over different data controllers, and I think that is a very um, smart thing to do for um, data protection authorities to actually compare different sharing practices and um, and the, the used legal basis, for example. And if we if we um, distinguish the provision of transparency information from the presentation of transparency information, that helps you a lot because you collect the information once and present it to different parties according to their needs. And um, some of these technical tools that I just presented help you with that process, but we have to talk a lot more about how, diff how actual complex systems look like, and I only touched the surface here. We, we are doing a lot with cloud providers, different cloud providers and, and distributed systems, but the variety of services is so big that I, and I just want you to engage with this whole field too. Let's talk more about how actual systems work, what happens in the back end, which are the data transfers that you cannot observe by uh, collecting information on cookies stored in, in, in the front end, but on actual infrastructures. If you're interested that, in that, look at our websites. We have two projects. The one is the Tucan, that's why we have the bird, and the other one is Daskita. And thanks for your attention. You can also find these slides online. Thank you. I already, I already saw it. Well, an attempt to make a photo which doesn't work. Um, I'm, I'm quite sure Elias will provide the slides afterwards if you want it. Um, any urgent questions in this break? That's not the case. Then we welcome our remote speaker. Hey, Luca. Okay. There you go. Hey. Stage is yours. Okay, nice. Um, hi, everyone. I hope everyone can see me. I'm joining in from uh, Toronto in Canada. So we'll have some Canadian perspective here also. So let me share my screen quickly so that you all can see the slides. Okay, are my slides visible? Yes. 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 Awesome. 
Okay, so um, I'm one of those folks that uh, Katerina talked about, you know, the 621% increase from 2017. So I'm one of those. Uh, we are Privado and uh, we are building privacy enhancement technologies, uh, transparency enhancement technologies, and uh, I represent this privacy engineering, uh, you know, tech landscape that is coming up. So what we'll be discussing today is uh, transparency and accountability, and I'll give you an industrial perspective on how we build these tools and uh, you know how they can be actually operationalized, and towards the end, a small wish list that I have. So this is how data looks initially. Uh, you know, uh, on the left side we see code in its inception stage, uh, and at this time there is no data. But eventually, as you start collecting, the code becomes you know websites, mobile apps, and bots. The collection increases, and then uh, we have more data transferred from these collecting services, which are just collecting this data and sending it to more processing, which is actually providing a service. You know, taking that data and making some decisions. Uh, or using it for analytics. So at this time, the spread is increasing. We can see that the spread is increasing towards the right. And then we don't know what these analytics and services are doing. They might be sharing it you know, to third party. You log into Netflix or to Facebook and it's the, your data is just not there with these two organizations. It goes multiple places also. We saw this complex you know, architecture that Elias had uh, put in. That's actually very true. And, and I've seen this in industry. It's too difficult to understand where your data will go. So all the text that I used to see for privacy policies, et cetera, it's very difficult to even understand what happens with, with that data. So uh, eventually it gets stored in, in databases, data lakes, and at that time it's, it's too difficult. So this is what's going on. At, at the early stage, we have no data just it's in the inception stage. We have an intention to create or move data, which is in the code. And then there's a little bit data, more data, and then enormous data. And what's happening is uh, that in real world, this is a real example of Shopizer you know, code. And you can see that a developer wrote a collected username and they logged it, log.info username. So what happens is when you run this in, in, in a uh, real environment, you'll have users interacting with this Shopizer. Shopizer is just a, a web app for uh, you know, e-commerce. So essentially customers are going to interact with this. And what's gonna happen is at each second, imagine you have a service running Shopizer and you'll have 500 people inputting their data. And then it goes onto a cloud logger, which you have no idea about what, where it is running. And then eventually it gets scraped from, from that logger and stored in 20 different databases. So you see the spread now, you know, this is exactly how, how it happens. At early stage, there was one line that defined the intention of what should be done with the data. We are taking it and logging it. And eventually what happens is it goes to 20 databases nobody has an idea about. And uh, so, so, you know, it's easy. You know, we can start looking towards the left, look at the intention. What was the intention of, uh, you know, what, what was supposed to be uh, with the data? Uh, this would be early, easy, and proactive. These are all the things that you know current regulations also talk about. You need to be proactive, you know, instead of being reactive about privacy. That's the way to go, uh, I would say. And then uh, the other approaches that we see in the industry is you know very late in stage. So you know you have the database and there is a tool like DSAR, data subject access request, and then you would go inside these databases, try to figure out where all the data is, you know, and then you either remove it, move it, or whatever the request was. And then, uh, uh, so, so essentially, like this is where we see modern privacy tools operating. They are looking at this border of data getting shared or getting stored and trying to understand what to do with it. But, we believe that it's very easy to go on the left hand side. So if you try to look at the data when it's already produced, it's you know huge, you know enormous spread everywhere. This is what it actually feels like. You know, it's kind of like sweeping the ocean. You know, there's an ocean of data everywhere, and you're trying to sweep it with a broom. That's not what we want to do. Uh, this is a small. Uh, you know, graph I created of what's happening with these tools these days on the y-axis is maturity of the solution. You can see the big players there, one trust, big ID, et cetera. And on the right is depth of engineering integration. So you see that 
the depth of engineering integration is more easy as we go towards the code because that's where the developers are. They are sitting down, they are thinking what to do with the data, they translate it into code. So the, so the, the in, engineering integration becomes very easy as we move towards the right because the data is not even there yet. It's at the inception stage so we can control it much more better. Uh, these approaches we usually see are also static in nature. So and static is more proactive. Even before things get released, you would know, you know, where, um, uh, you know, what's what's supposed to happen to the data. And some of the tools are there who are, you know, approaching towards that. Uh, the other layers that we see very common these days is the border of APIs and databases intercepting at that layer. And uh, there are tools like DataGrail, Transcend, uh, Fidels, who have you know a language already defined, a configuration-based language, and they can define what to do with it. They directly intercept into data moving through the APIs. You know, you you have developed an app, you decided to use Slack, or you decided to use Salesforce or any of these third-party services. Uh, they would try to intercept the data going there and understand what, what's happening here. Um, and towards the code side, uh, the approach is more really understanding what the developer intended to do. When the developer wants to interact with Salesforce or Slack, they will write some code so you can even intercept it before it even runs. So that's kind of like the approach here. An ideal case which I have is this, this cone that I've created where the capabilities overlap so that you can completely observe infra, DB, APIs, code, you know, towards the system. And that's where, uh, you know, privacy engineering tools are slowly, slowly approaching towards. So let's look at the impact on uh, transparency and accountability here. So this is a document uh, from the Department of Justice, you know, in, uh, in Canada. And this document specifically talks about accountability and transparency and, and its effects on privacy. And uh, regulations are now being drawn up. So this is more kind of like a discussion document to push towards these regulations now. And in that clearly we see the benefits of a strong privacy management program are clear, integrating privacy management programs into the Privacy Act could. Uh, and two of the things that I've highlighted are support a transition away from reactive oversight model to a more uh, efficient proactive one and encourage holistic data governance by networking or linking a wide range of policies and governance tools together through privacy management program hub. So an example they also state is the algorithmic impact assessment tool. If you, this is really interesting because it's a, it's something that you have to do these days uh, where uh, if you're using AI technologies and you're working with the government, you would have to do an algorithmic, algorithmic impact assessment, uh, pretty tongue twisting here. So um, where you have to specify what you do with the data, how it was collected, uh, and you know what's the impact on this automated decision that the tool will take. But you know what? This actually is just a spreadsheet. So an engineering mind is not going to work exactly like that. They're going, they're going to look at this big document and they will start moving towards the right. So they will see that we need, we need to keep users informed wherever in our service we are collecting data. And on the accountability side, they will say, okay, need to know who is doing what with the customer data. And we can keep on moving. And for transparency, they will start saying, identify points in our apps where private data is collected, and then minimize collection information in a non legally exact purpose and provable steps to uh, safeguard data. Inform the user about these things. Same with accountability, in uh, in identify points in all apps where private data is collected, who decided this collection, what tech did they use, and then establish a clear provable data ownership chain. So these are the requirements that engineering folks are going to think about. And in my mind, this is how it starts looking at it. So we it starts right from the code. We, we have code, and then we can scan that code, and as it gets developed and gets deployed, data goes in multiple places, we discuss this. But what we can do when we have TNA probably logged is kind of like an internal TNA log that could be created. So you can see on the first step itself, when Ankita creates code to log username using Apache Logger, the scanner just tells you know, us that, okay, she created uh, this code, which is logging username, and it's using Apache Logger. And then uh, the, the scan now keeps on looking at the whole system and starts uh, adding more information towards this. Username is being sent to a logging service. It's running in US East. The release gets pushed. You know, when a new release is done, it gets pushed. 
analytics team has access to logging. This is inferred from infrastructure as code. And you know, a lot of these deployments and everything that you see they, these days is just code. Nobody is sitting down and pushing buttons. It's all defined where this specific part of the whole application is supposed to go. So you've, you've, um, got, you've got minus one and a half minutes left. <laughs> okay, that's the last slide. That's good. So this is what our intention would be, you know, have customer UX, privacy management center, you know, then you can say the customer can see your inversion. Uh, point uh, zero 01 of the Foo app, beginning 2023, Foo began accessing your username. So these are very dynamic, you know, uh, privacy uh, uh, identification, you know, of, of what's happening to your data and what you want to do with it. Uh, okay, I'll skip, skip the next slide. This is essentially how you can maintain, scan early, be proactive, have an accountability chain, and have a transparency UX embedded in the system. That ends my presentation. All right, great. Thank you. Again, any uh, urgent question from the audience before we get the final piece of the whole picture? Not? Then let me introduce Isabel. All right, so you've heard by now that the GDPR, GDPR says certain pieces of information should be made known to users. You also heard that information should be presented in non-legalese language with specific purposes. Well, so how, how does that happen at the moment? Hmm, privacy policies. Who of you has read more than one privacy policy in the last month? OK, well, to be expected with this audience. The ones you didn't write yourself? <laughs> <laughs> so well, you all know they are getting longer, right? Um, and maybe are not super readable by regular users. But let me tell you some facts about the actual contents of things written in privacy policies. So this figure you see here, um, the top line is data types that privacy policies assert the collection of. Bottom row is data types they state they do not collect. Then on the left hand, it's first party data collection. On the right hand side, it's data passed on to third parties. And I only want to point out three things. First, uh, the bottom row you observe, so each of the colored bars represents one year. So you can see over time, the amount of data types that are not being collected is going down. So that's, that's already um, not so great. The second thing you can see is, I want to point out one specific information type, and that's location data at number two. Um, so that rapidly increasing, of course, correlated with use of mobile devices. Um, but then the truly concerning thing is number three. Uh, the two largest, highest groups of bars there are generic personal information passed to third parties and unspecified data passed to third parties. And that's, in each case, more than half of all the privacy policies in that study. So. This, this large amount of unspecified data that goes somewhere indicates that actually privacy policies are not super specific. The opposite, actually, they're quite vague. This vagueness we can also measure by another thing. We can look at uh, something called obfuscating words. So things like may, significantly, approximately, um, predominantly, you, you, you can imagine, right? And if you just look at the blue line, that's the fraction of sentences in privacy policies that contain at least one obfuscating word. Um, and that blue line, you see it's steadily increasing. So at the moment, it's 70% of sentences in all privacy policies have at least one of these words, which really make those policies very hard to follow for like, regular people. So in essence, privacy policies don't really tell us what we want to know, right? I mean, I'm an academic, I want facts. So 
what, what we need is basically some sort of method that we can use from the outside to establish transparency sort of in an adversarial manner, right? That we could study systems while not being part of those systems and still find out facts about their data practices and whether they reveal that the data practices are um, good for users or not. And you can design those methods in an, in an empirical experimental way. You treat the system as a black box. You have some inputs that you can control as an experimenter, researcher. You have some outputs that you can um, see, that you can um, post-process. And then you can analyze some metrics of interest. And in that way, if you apply that like on a web scale, you can find out to what extent are users tracked on the web. Um, you can also make a design so that you can identify which information has to flow inside of the black box. For example, um, in this case, the experimenters found out which information has to be passed between ad exchanges, supply side platforms, and demand side platforms um, to enable the showing of retargeted ads to users. And then, of course, we can also analyze whether ad, the ad delivery mechanism is biased, for example, based on gender, based on race, which it turns out it is. Um, and we can find out whether search results or search result personalization is biased. And that can have big implications for um, like um, politics and democracy as well. So all of these methods work. They have been applied to many different problems. They have found many privacy issues. Some of them have also led to GDPR complaints and fines. And talking about all of that right now would be too much. I unfortunately have to defer you to my book. Um, <laughs> but there is a catch. And that catch is that especially very large companies are, of course, not they, they don't like being studied. They don't like their data, shady data practices to come to light. So they attempt to obstruct this research. Um, and also, uh, sometimes, I try to intimidate the researchers to just not start research project, projects in that area. And one example was, of course, Facebook that um, blocked the Facebook accounts of researchers and then claimed that their research violated the privacy of Facebook users. Um, that was a nice argument. So based on this, I think we need three things. First of all, we need to really mandate auditability of these tech systems from the outside. Because clearly, what companies are telling users is not sufficient. We need some independent mechanism for verifying their data practices. Second, I think we need to take inspiration from product safety. You can't sell a car without a seatbelt. You can't sell a car that hasn't passed 100 safety tests. Why, do you, why, why can you offer services that violate user privacy without any oversight? So we need to take inspiration there, perhaps. And number three, I think we need to be very clear that users should have a right to self-defense. In the web context, think ad blockers, perhaps. But that right should also be, hmm, let's say, granted in a way that companies shouldn't be able to fight against it. Um, think anti-ad blockers, right? So any of these, I think, would move user privacy actually forward instead of just ticking boxes. So with that, um, I think we should have an interesting discussion. All right, thank you, Isabel. Um, again, the last time the question for any urgent clarifications or so. Otherwise, I would start with a 
First round of questions here on the, on the stage, and my first one goes to Katarina again. Um, Katarina, you, well, you laid out a set of 10 business benefits um, on, your, on your final slide, um, to, well, ranging from improved compliance to enhanced user trust and so forth. Um, well, would you say, especially from your perspective within the Valley, does industry actually recognize these benefits? And do they actually act upon these benefits and, well, behave in order to, to manifest them? Um, is this on? OK. Yeah, so I can only talk from my personal experience, right? I did not conduct a study on the subject. But I mean, yes, I'm based in San Jose in Silicon Valley, and I'm covering privacy engineering for the IPP. And um, I am also organizing, uh, since a while, um, in-person meetings for privacy engineers. And I also only want privacy engineers um, on, the, <laughs> on stage. So legal people are welcome, but <laughs> it's not the target audience. And I mean, we see in Silicon Valley that privacy engineering teams are really growing, right? There's this big demand. I mean, pri um, PVC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, was um, uh, declaring the privacy engineering talent, sh talent shortage as one of the privacy mega trends last year. So I think in general, privacy engineering is a growing field with a lot of idealists and a growing community uh, across companies. Um, and a lot of uh, something that is always discussed is how to communicate privacy engineering goals to other teams to make like create win-win situations, uh, for example, repurpose security tools for privacy, or um, yeah, how to uh, talk with legal, you know, legal tech talk, <laughs> always a topic. So I do think that companies, like leading companies or companies in Silicon Valley do absolutely integrate privacy tech or have privacy engineering increasingly like really in, in focus. OK, great, cool. Good to know. Um, a question to Elias. Taking taking into account the whole spectrum that you presented from, well, fancy user interfaces to very, very low level network monitoring and so forth. What would you say where, where do you see the, the biggest challenge for uh, your sketched vision to actually come true? Yes, I think there are several perspectives on that. First, I spoke a lot about technology, and of course, these are the questions that we ask, uh, ask ourselves as computer scientists. There are 500 different databases. There are different ways of how you can offer an API. There are loads of different programming languages and so on. So where can we put our tools into place where they are most effective? If we develop something they, that, that should be scalable, that should be usable by many infrastructures, because the infrastructures are so diverse, and we have, therefore, to find some some tools that integrate very well with a lot of different technologies. And for that, of course, it's, it makes sense to, to think about it in, in advance before you develop something very specialized to just one, one programming language or that works with only a single type of databases um, because that won't be interoperable and uh, won't uh, be something that, that you can train uh, developers on because, of course, they also have limited time and interests uh, oftentimes um, in transparency enhancing technologies. And that leads me to the second um, perspective, I think, because I talked about technology, but and you can even split that into application layer, platform layer, infrastructure layer, different types of um, architectural questions, technical questions, but of course also the organizational questions, how to communicate within an enterprise, how to um, educate developers and, and to um, make their lives easy to fulfill the task of making the software more transparent. So many, many perspectives. Um, well, so Haka, does that match with your experience? So do you have the feeling that, um, well, industry is ready for some sort of such technologies? Are they actually, well, hungry for implementing stuff like this? Yeah, so uh, I would say on a, uh, for large organizations, I have seen that they are ready. They have you know people in operations and technology in place that they can they can build this on. Uh, for smaller organizations or medium-sized organizations, they are still more on 
working on you know spreadsheets trying to understand what, how to exactly solve this so those organizations are very much driven by okay is there going to be a fine like really like really that's what motivates them are we going to get fined tomorrow so i would i would just remove the veneer of everything and just say it really is about getting a lot of fines put into place when you uh, you know breach someone's privacy like look you know if someone you know takes away your clothes you know it's not acceptable so it's exactly like here you know if companies start taking away your clothes that's not acceptable so um i would say that uh, they are ready the technology is ready it's just about the push that should should be start operationalizing it and i believe everyone can you know we have done this in cybersecurity we can do this in privacy immediately yeah that would also match the state of the art argument that katarina made right well, interesting. Um, so one, one thing, uh, even in the preparation um, of, of this panel, I, I definitely like this term of adversarial transparency because it is like, okay, I'm fighting against someone and so forth. Um, whereas, well, uh, well, I can imagine, and you already said that, um, companies are not so happy about having this approach being carried out and, and are actually trying to avoid it and so forth. Um, and do, do you have the feeling or do you have an idea whether there is some sort of a pass out, a more cooperative pass that we could probably strive for um, in order not to be, work against each other? I think it's not a 100% clear cut answer. So I think the very largest big tech organizations, I don't feel much cooperation coming from them. Um, but on the other hand, the, the vast majority of organizations, um, smaller, medium-sized companies, for example, they don't really want to um, violate user privacy. They, in, all, in, in many cases, just have another purpose. I don't know whether, whether that's a sustainability startup. They, they have something else on their mind. So in those cases, I think an approach borrowed from security um, with responsible disclosure where you find something and you initiate a conversation with that organization first and try to help them understand how to, what the problem is and how can then they can do it better, um, that's relatively likely to be successful. And um, much more cooperative. Okay, interesting, interesting insight. Um, so, given that we have this lucky situation of having so more, so so many tech savvy people in the room, um, I'm I'm quite sure there will be questions. So, there is room for raising some questions. There is at least one, Michael. So first of all, thanks a lot for, to all the panelists for providing this uh, nice overview of the different uh, approaches to data subject rights and transparency in total. I'm, I'm really lucky, happy to see that this is still a hot topic in research because, uh, I mean, um, we see a lot, a lot of people discussing privacy just on the level of, yeah, do we encrypt the data enough or do we actually um, provide some pets here or there? But uh, the, uh, the other side that we uh, now have with the data subject rights, with the access to the data, with the transparency, that is somehow, to my feeling at least, a little bit neglected. Neg Elected, especially when it comes to companies, Isabel has spoken about that. So they are. Um, we, we tried to do an analysis just by means of right of access. We asked 15 companies, none of them even responded. So that was uh, our experience on that. And so. Um, maybe uh, if I have to go for a question, so for maybe for going to the direction of Elia. So thanks a lot for providing this nice overview, for instance, for Netflix having 500 th services. Of course, this is a very challenging thing to realize in the data subject request and how to, to answer that one. But I was actually missing some part of it. It's not just Netflix. It's like multiple organizations, multiple different stakeholders, different companies collaborating to create that network. So uh, the question that I would like to pose is, uh, from the legal point of view, we often have this idea of one single data controller. Yeah, and we ask that one, and that one will answer, and if that one doesn't know the answer, it will just ask its pro data processor. Is that still true in such a microservices architecture? Can we still keep that up? I mean, with blockchain, we created a system with multiple joint data controllers, right? 
Yes, thanks for the great question. Of course, it's like that. Even uh, all, also the three um, companies that I just showed you are probably somehow connected. And it's it starts with every website that has some kind of payment provider or, or some uh, location service and so on. So the, I think there is no modern service um, that has some relevance, um, some million users without being in an in a ad sharing network or, or in an other data exchange um, network. So yes, of course, we have to deal with that. and. What our answer for now is, um, we developed this, I touched on, on that briefly, the tilt format, which is this structured representation of transparency information. Because with that, um, and if we assume many of these companies would um, adhere to such a standard, which of course should be developed cooperatively in an open way without being dictated by by some, even not even by the European Commission or some, some, some other entity or, or even uh, uh, proprietary entity, but they should collaboratively agree on such a standard to exchange that particular information. And if they do that, then they can quickly identify, yes, if we include this third party service, they add these new purpose limitations or they um, they enhance the number of, of third parties or they, they change the, the storage period for a particular data category. And if you have that in such a machine readable format, then I think that's the only chance to, to cope with that. And without having that in place, you are um, making a lot of work for, for lawyers and so on to scan their privacy policies. And they should do that on a daily basis to, to keep track of all the updates. And that doesn't happen in practice. We know that. So that's the path forward, I think. Great, further question. Over there. Um, thank you. I'm Christian Reimstar from the OECD. Um, I guess I will formulate maybe my, my question in simple terms, and I will like, elaborate a little bit why, why I'm interested in that. Essentially, the question is, how can we make sure that we can still provide that transparency that we all are kind of seeking, while at the same time kind of respecting also the intellectual property rights of the, the businesses? Because as we look at, for instance, the different maps that you saw from Netflix and so on, um, one of the reasons why this information is not provided widely is because this is obviously also part of the secret sauce. Um, and it can really be a major concern. Um, obviously, the question here is then how do we deal with that? Um, I see the benefit clearly when it comes to internal transparency, because there is also sec um, cybersecurity benefits in, in doing that. But when it comes to adversarial or whatever term we want to use, the external um, need for transparency, where there is the biggest need for that, I still wonder how can we get there. And I, I like the approach of the white hackers or the, um, I don't remember the term that you used, um, but I see also serious limitations in that. Um, and I wonder if there are other real um, potential, uh, serious alternative to, to, to to get to that transparency besides eventually the government's kind of mandating that. But I fear that if that would be the case, um, I see businesses coming with, wait a minute, what about our intellectual property rights? Who feels like I want to answer that question? I can say some things. Um, <sighs> It's, it's, a, it's a balance, right, between intellectual property rights and, well, human rights. Um, <laughs> um, and there is always, so I feel like traditionally there has been this conception that at least public institutions, but perhaps also um, private companies should be transparent, whereas human individuals have privacy. Now, in the last decade or two, um, private companies have tried to reverse that situation. And as they have gained ever more insight into um, every individual human, but at the same time, try to block all information about what they do and how they do this um, from public inspection. So, I mean, maybe I'm a bit of a fundamentalist in, the, in this regard. So I think they, um, let's say they've earned money with privacy violations for so long, they need to suffer some, 
<laughs> intellectual property violations, perhaps. All right, I think, Hakram, um, yeah, I actually yeah, wanted to I, answer. I think, I, I think I can add a few things to that. So thanks a lot, Isabel. So uh, uh, I have observed in organizations that I think data itself is not really the intellectual property that becomes, you know, IP. Uh, it's it's the technology around or how to process it or what to do about it. That That is the IP. So we can separate this out if we really want to do it inside organizations. We can say that like data is kind of like, you know, uh, water running through the pipe, but how the design of the pipe itself is uh, is the IP there. So there is an op opportunity to you know split this out and very concretely you know for um, organizations you know and uh, governments to really put their foot down and say that you know let's let's separate this out. Data is not really the IP here. Uh, it's what to do with the data. So, so I don't really see a problem in this. It can actually be handled properly if it's if it's supposed to. But you know, it needs this collaboration with people. I, I would also agree with you, Asu Chakra, because I mean, you had had this study and you came from the outside, like seeking transparency from the outside, adversarial, right? But like privacy tech usually helps the business to respond faster to yep. data subject access requests or do code scanning that I do know where is my personal data. So that doesn't conflict with IP issues at all from my perspective. I would also have a position, but that's not part of my, part of my role today. Yep. <laughs> Any further questions? from the audience. Another one, a follow-up question, or rather there in the back? Start with the follow-up, and we, we briefly handle that one. Thank you. I mean, obviously, the internal use for transparency isn't their big issues, and, I, and, and there is de definitely value in that. Um, but I think it's all about the external one. Um, and I wonder, very briefly, if there is a chance for instance, for privacy enhancing technologies to play a role to share this kind of information with the public in a confidential way. Just a question. So that's part of the next coffee chat. Yeah. <laughs> All right, then there was one question in the back somewhere. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm an innovation management researcher. I'm really interested in how organizations kind of bring this across to the customer. So uh, I'm a bit of an outsider here in this crowd. I find it absolutely fascinating. But you all started with, you know, people don't read the privacy things. So what, what, what is possible? What could we do in terms of privacy engineering to make them read it, to really take the customer along in, I mean, you, you all had fascinating stories about what to do internally and how to make it better. But how, how to actually bring it to the customer? That would be my interest. I assume that would go to Elias. Yeah, maybe I can explain two examples that we recently developed. So yes, we started from the same point. Nobody reads privacy policies. Nobody wants to read them. And of course, it's also a very obstructive procedure to search for a privacy policy in the first place and then to look at that every day and, and to search for the updates. But what we did and what we also um, evaluated with some user studies is, for example, the provision of transparency information among search results. Think of, think of a Google page where you search for any term, and then a side of each uh, website, you, you display a little icon, a, a traffic light or something. And if you then click on this one website it, with an, a green indication, that means good privacy practice, then you don't have to actively think about it, but you just get guided within your usual process of searching something. And that works very well. And second example, we developed, like, on the basis of machine-readable transparency information, we can do funny things across different providers. We can, of course, create an interface, such as a chatbot, that you can ask, please, um, which service has the higher privacy level, or which to which service, uh, to which third countries do service A and service B share my data. And if you have such, such a thing, it's much more easy to, to actually get that information. And these are just two examples which are very easy and, and um, effective in what we, what we saw in practice. And another follow-up. Yeah. Highly welcome. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really like that. I, I think that's what we, from a consumer point of view, are looking for. But at the same time, I also want to say that this is actually not transparent, right? I mean, 
it helps me and it, it gives trust, but it's actually the opposite of transparent. So there is a bit of a paradox between transparency and trust uh, that, that I observe as well. And I can see that you know transparency leads to trust, but if I trust, I don't need transparency anymore. So there's a bit of a paradox in this transparency versus trust that I observed. Maybe just a very quick follow-up. What we sometimes delineate that design space is, is, in, is preference, competence, and context. So if you have the preference to gain a lot of more information, then you just click on see all the information. But if you have the preference of only quickly get an overview of the different services or practices, then just provide me with an icon or something. And same for competencies. All the people in the room are able in, uh, to understand what legal basis Article 61A means, but a lay person doesn't, of course. Yeah. Hi, um, first of all, thanks again for this uh, amazing panel. Um, my question um, relates a bit to underlying power structures, because I see um, the value if you compare different services, that transparency can really make a difference. But you also showed the graph of Netflix, um, and where we might not have the choice, or the yeah, usual lay person that is not really interested in um, privacy sensitive services um, to switch between Google Maps or I don't know, like an alternative. Do you see that there's a potential for um, privacy enhancing technologies concerning to transparency, like to actually make a change and kind of like overcome these platform power structures? Thanks. Katerina, maybe, or Isabel, don't you know. Me? <laughs> uh, well, so when we have situations, in my opinion, when we have situations where, uh, where we basically have no choice, so that there is, um, I think there are two conceptions of what this transparency information is for. The first one is like this US informed, uh, informed choice, blah, blah, blah. Uh, thing, but that, that does not make so much sense and that, uh, when you actually have no choice, right? And therefore, um, well, basically in such a situation, that's why we have regulations, because people cannot choose. Um, still, in that case, people can shape their behavior and being aware of what is actually going on if um, so if I have that information in a sufficient level of detail and preciseness and so forth, that still allows me to reflect and to understand what's going on, um, even when I don't have a choice. So I, basically, I always have the choice to use a service or not, hopefully. Um, and secondary uh, thing is that when people are aware of those practices, they that has an influence on public opinion shaping and on well what what well data protection authorities actually do whether they actually are pushed toward getting in, into action and so forth and so forth so I, I think all those transparency information have a have a well have a right to be there and and are important even beyond this notice and choice paradigm uh, between different services especially when it comes to such things like cross-service analysis of um, data transfers and cooperation and, and so forth, um, that, that allows to reveal a lot of, well, sharing networks, um, all those things where, um, where power culminates at certain points or so. So I, I think even in those situations, it's highly worthwhile to have that information. Further question, I think we have, yeah, we have that time. don't want to take the time from others to ask questions, but... Uh, Rather a comment than a question, but that's fine. <laughs> Go ahead. Especially on that, I had some, some, some point that is, uh, I think, quite relevant because um, when we talk of transparency, I mean, transparency is not a self-service. It's like uh, there is always a motivation behind access requests, for instance. And I think that's a very important thing to consider when we talk about transparency. There's always a purpose. There's always a reason why I'm asking a company, what have you stored about me? It might be because I just got an email that I'm wondering, why did you get, where did you get my email address? 
interest from. In that case, I'm just interested in what companies are involved in the chain that actually led to you getting my email. Yeah, I'm not interested in the full disclosure of all the databases on what you have stored about me, and I'm not interested in your business partners or whatever. I'm just interested in the next step then, use this transparency to learn whom to appoint my uh, right to intervention to, to say, uh, uh, I intervene with the processing, please delete my information now, um, please delete my email address. So then transparency serves this uh, basis to be uh, in, in the next step to be able to intervene. And uh, I, for other purposes, think of the right to data portability. I might want to get all my data out in a technical format so that I can switch to a different provider. So that's a totally underestimated uh, right in the GDPR to my personal consideration. Uh, but very closely related to transparency. And what I would love to see, and where I hope I get some, some inputs from you, is how to implement such, let's say, different purposes and the uh, required transparency levels for these purposes into the particular systems at companies. So. Yeah, good point for future research. <laughs> You're welcome to join us. <laughs> I can maybe quickly answer on that. Like most of the papers we wrote, write currently start with transparency is a precondition for many other privacy principles. So you can only do data minimization if you know in the first place where your data are stored at, clearly. And you touched upon data access, data portability, also very prime examples. You uh, mentioned data security purposes, but also all the other um, privacy principles from the GDPR and beyond are solved with that. And regarding, maybe also connecting your question and your comment regarding the different information needs. So again, if we have it in a machine readable format, we can offer an API and we can provide different stakeholders different levels of information. Maybe it's, if we professionalize the whole transparency game, acceptable to share more information with a data protection authority than with the public. That's the same what happens in the most of most countries I know with your tax return or so. You don't publish it, um, but uh, of course your, your uh, federal government has to know um, more information and we can professionalize that if we somehow standardize the process. So time is quite running. Um, I accept that last question and then I will do a quick final round. Or was out there? Okay. Hi, this is a kind of a follow-up then. Um, it, probably for Elias, do you see a movement towards more um, specific machine-readable transparency? Because we also saw from Isabel's work that the privacy policies have a lot of vague terms. There's a lot of uncertainty and openness. And sometimes the companies don't know what they're going to do with it when they write it. So do you see a push for more specificity? Or do you think it will happen? So I think I can take this one, uh, or at least I can begin. Uh, so not, not to block, block you, Isabel, I'll, I'll come back to you quickly. Um, uh, so one thing that I'm seeing continuously is from, and, and uh, why I jumped in is because I talked to a lot of customers who from small enterprises, medium enterprises, and they continuously ask us, can you please read our policies and convert them to a defined thing that can actually be implemented in engineering? Like this is the broad question they all have. And I just don't have an answer for it because on one side it's like regulation, you know, which is, which is in big text that they don't understand very clearly. And then on the other side is their own policy and they want us to match and create a machine, uh, you know, understandable thing that can run on their systems and completely adheres to both their policies as well as, as that. So, yeah, I think it's an open question, but there is a movement towards it. Yeah, on to you, Isabel. Yeah, I mean, one open source project that is working on this, but so Chakra, correct me if I misunderstood, is uh, Ethicus Fidas. So Ethica is ha having this open source project and with the goal of um, having machine readable privacy policies that are then yes. enforceable in an yes. automated way. And they also have a privacy taxonomy, like how you, uh, yeah, which, which tags to attach to the code, right? Um, like yeah, how exactly. did you collect so, uh, it, what purpose, and then it follows around the, the data around in your uh, infrastructure. That's that's precisely what it is. So there's a big definition that I saw in their open source implementation uh, of of like a YAML format where you can define individual policies 
uh, what, what's supposed to be done, you can add tags to it. And then uh, they go inside your infrastructure and then see if there is a violation there. And uh, I think our approach also, and, and I'm from Pravada, so our approach is also the same. We have an open source tool. Uh, it, it creates a YAML representation, but it's a little bit more deeper because it's linked directly to the code. So you can define a policy that a username should never go to Slack or something like that. And then, then it enforces it at the code level. So they enforce it at the API level, we enforce it at the code level, but to, to say the movement is there, uh, there is no clearly defined automatic system that takes in GDPR and translates it to that. I think that's the missing piece. But the tech is there. You know, we are just waiting. That's what I would say. Yeah, that's that's a very important message. So, um, so in the name of time, uh, but still, uh, we are also at CPDP, and uh, I. I I want to use uh, this presence of this technical uh, subject at CPDP for a final round, uh, asking one question um, and asking every panelist to answer this question within one sentence, at maximum two sentences, in reverse order of appearance. So starting with Isabel. Um, what is, in your opinion, the most valuable change that regulators so change or amendment that regulators could make to the existing landscape um, in order to, well, foster the field of transparency and accountability. You thought of a very small question here. <laughs> sure. The one change to improve transparency We can also skip. I can go first. Go more, first. More enforcement, more staff, more budget. More enforcement, that's yeah. the word. Yeah. Suhakta. One sentence. Uh, yeah. I would say deliver fines. Deliver okay. fines, more yeah. enforcement. And 1.3 yeah. billion, or what was that? Yeah. Bring, bring in. Uh, um, you know, unleash the, the the way you know hackers have been unleashed and security yeah. is now woken up. Unleash the privacy hackers to find out where what is what are the uh, orgs doing with the data, and then once it's in public, the operation starts. I would say. Great message, Isabel. Second chance. Yeah, I have something now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think a sort of a mandate for. Uh, independent audit would be helpful, whether that's um, mandating maybe opening internal APIs to researchers, doesn't have to be every researcher on the planet, but some sort of independent oversight. Um, and if the regulator doesn't want to pay auditors themselves, they, well, they can piggyback on researchers perhaps. Great idea, and finally, Elias. Uh, for those who know, in Article 13 of the GDPR, there's the list of transparency information, and I would add one more paragraph saying this information has to be provided in a structured, machine-readable format. Yeah. Period. <laughs> All right. Um, I hope some regulators listened. Um, we're coming to the end of this wonderful panel. I thank all those panelists um, for being here, for joining us, for also being available for contact via mail, LinkedIn, Twitter, or whatever for being approached at the next, um, well, together with the next coffee or in the next um, water or whatever. Um, I think everybody is also willing to share their slides upon request, just approach us. Um, thanks for being here, thanks for this nice, and for again, for CPDP, I'm super happy about having this technology interested, um, well, Mindset here in the room, that was great. Let's have more of that next year. Thank you for being here.